All right, guys. So today is the first episode of what I would call a sit down with a friend. So this is a much more casual version of the podcast episodes that we had. Alex has been a good friend to me and is a good friend of mine. And so, and obviously, as you guys know, he's an expert when it comes to the technical and tactical side of things. And, you know, guys, I really don't have anything planned. Like, I don't have anything written down. I don't have any questions. But from my experience with Alex, he's someone who I can just talk shop with. And I don't really have to plan very much. And through the things that he says, more and more questions just pop up. So, Alex, thanks for coming on, man. Like, I, I honestly, let's see where this conversation takes us. Looking forward to it, Will. Yeah. So just off your social media stuff, I want to jump right into something that's I personally had a big interest in because my background is in uh, movement and strength and conditioning and all that kind of stuff. Um, and now I'm talking to someone who is in the technical tactical side. Talk to me about your experience with differential learning when it comes to shooting. Okay. So um, differential learning has been something I've started really getting into, I'd say from even just as recently as the 1st of January. So over Christmas, I basically did a big research project on shooting and I was, I was doing a, I was accessing a bunch of studies, which would be done on shooting. And I really wanted to think about how I could use nonlinear pedagogy and apply it to shooting using strategies such as the CLA, which is a constraints led approach and differential learning. So, you know, I think first we've got to look at what the traditional approach is. So, so coaches can kind of understand the different approaches, right. That we have, and then we'll kind of look at what differential learning is and the exercises I've been doing. So I'd say firstly, the traditional approach would be um, one idealized way of shooting and that would simply be the coach teaching something that maybe worked for them as a player or something they were taught by another coach. And they're trying to impart that technique onto the player. And it's, you know, talking about repeatability of techniques. So the shot has to look the same every time, right? This would be the traditional approach. And typically this would be accompanied by a lot of internal feedback. For instance, put your elbow here, wrist here, finish here. So very, very internalized feedback. Um, and I think when we see a lot of traditional uh, approaches to shooting, a lot, a lot of the time I see this would be done with massed repetitions and typically things like spot shooting and the idea of trying to build muscle memory. But as we know, there's no such thing as muscle memory. And, and there's a whole blog I've, I've, I did release that a couple months ago. So you know, if, if we know the traditional approach, it just simply doesn't align with mm -hmm. motor learning and what happens in a game. Because if, if, even if you just, even if you, you know, coaches don't want to look at the evidence which exists, if you just even just watch a basketball game and focus on one player, you'll see that every single basketball shot is different. Um, and, and that's because it's, every, it's open skills. You know, it's, it's an unstable basketball, it's a complex environment. Defenders, Con different constraints, presence of teammates, where you're getting the ball from, the triggers you're running, all of this stuff means every shot's different, right? Um, and the free throw is, is the only shot in basketball which is predictable. It's a closed skill, right? It's like something like diving or something like that. And the problem is most coaches teach shooting assuming every shot is a free throw, but it's not. Right. Do you, and, sorry. Do you mean that like any shot besides the, like a three, any three point shot, they teach it as if it was a free throw? Yes, because okay, they're, they're doing it with predetermined outcomes, telling right. them where they're going to shoot from, what the shot's going to be, etc. Right. And and this is the problem with the traditional approach. And if you just focus on one player in a game, like I said, and if you just watch them really carefully, yes, you'll see some common. Uh, elemental variables and some some things which look repeatable, but it's not exactly the same. That's the key dif differentiator. It is, it's just impossible. It's physically impossible for every shot to be the same. Even, you know, even just things like fatigue levels, what happens, you know, with your perception of your brain, the time of the game, let alone all the other more complex things like defenders, individual constraints, which we won't get into now, it's just physically impossible. And yet the way we teach shooting is every shot's the same. So what are the alternatives? Well, one is the constraint-led approach, 
um, which I'm sure we'll get into later. And the other would be differential learning. And um, differential learning is really fun. And particularly for warm-ups, I see a lot of use in warm-ups. So it was invented by a guy called Wolfgang Schollhorn. And the idea is that you're basically um, getting the players performing shooting with several different movement variations and basically embracing movement variability is a good thing instead of noise. So as you see with most traditional coaches, you'd see, you know, maybe players do something slightly different with their shot each time. And the coach would be like, all right, you've got to make, make it the same, even though it's physically impossible. For instance, say you're doing a blast cut at speed or a baseline drift, if you're doing that at speed, you're going to have some element of a small lean, right? And it's like maybe uh, uh, you're doing that with a traditional coach and they'll be like, all right, you have to finish perfectly on balance. Mm -hmm. Whereas in differential learning, we're actually infusing all these different movement variations into the practice and getting them to, getting athletes to experiment. And the idea is that it, it's basically opening up their degrees of freedom. So it's getting them used to different like joint movements, combinations. I'll give you an example, a guy like Shaquille O'Neal. If you look at a lot of the worst shooters in NBA history, um, they, they're very rigid and their degrees of freedom are basically frozen in terms of super stiff, super rigid, and they're not well coordinated. So the idea of differential learning is that we can free those degrees of freedom by giving them loads of different movement perturbations. So for instance, we could do things like different shooting on different stances, different arcs. So they have to self-organize to, to shoot with different arcs, quick release, long release. And the idea is that every rep is different. So it's not, okay, you're going to shoot 10 in a row, the same block practice. It's okay. You're going to shoot one wide stance, one narrow stance, one staggered stance, and you're doing it from a different location every time. Um, so this is essentially, you know, the essence of differential learning for me, I think this could be a game changer, particularly in an NBA context for shooting, because I understand that with CLA and when you, when you start adding defenders and things like that, it can be difficult. I think always to do that in the NBA environment, because a, a lot of the, the practices are individuals and B players just don't want to play defense. They're not going to play defense if they're an NBA player. Right. And you'd need a lot of coaches to play D. And then, you know, is that really task representative? I don't know. So ideally, you would have a mixture of CLA where they where, for instance, they're doing something like a, a constrained one on one or a two on one to get the most time on task. Right. That would be my my idea. So something like two on one shooting would be great one on one, but maybe they can only shoot a three. But then if you mix that with the differential learning, I think that's the formula for success. And, and that would be kind of my, if, if, you know, that would be my recommendation to teams really wanting to get the edge with their shooting and apply nonlinear pedagogy. And I, I think the differences you could see with this would be amazing. Biggest thing, well, of course, that we haven't spoken about yet is Brad's. So I think that to me is the root of everything with my shooting, back rim and down. Uh, huge research done on this by the NOAA uh, Shot Tracker System. They, they released a big study on this where they analyzed thousands of shots and they found that the, the shots which were Brad's gave the ball the best chance of going in. It's just the angle of entry uh, being most opt optimal. It's just the, the nature of how it works in relation to 45 degree angle of entry to the rim. So um, for us, everything we do is shooting Brad's and that's the best external cue. So as opposed to, it's basically a task constraint in itself because as opposed to just making a shot, it's got to be a Brad shot. So then, you know, players self-organize to to score brad and we celebrate that out every time we make a brad in practice they got to call it out so it's brad brad um and last thing i'll say just on this self-organizing the biggest kind of thing i'm seeing that a lot of coaches are struggling to understand is how players can self-organize and how skills are basically an emergent behavior and coaches seem to find it very difficult to grasp the fact that players will do things without being explicitly taught it. And it's just, it's impossible to imagine and to, it's, it's just impossible. Like if you consider the nature of human development, for instance, you know, when we learn to walk, when we, how we learn, like when we learn to talk, everyone learns at different rates, human development is nonlinear. And it's like, you know, 
many coaches believe that players have to be taught something for it to show up in a game. And it's just completely incongruent with human development and how we work. That's so much there. I, I don't know if you saw, I was like writing. Oh, man, was, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> no, 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 no. There's so much. Give me another example, Alex, of CLA combined with differential learning. Okay. So for me, differential learning is excellent for warm ups because in the warm up now, how I'm viewing the warm up is to free up their degrees of freedom and get them to do as many joint combinations as possible in like a 15, 20 minute span. What, what do you mean by degrees of freedom? Does that mean like dynamic stretching? What do you mean by that? Okay, so basically degrees of freedom, it's, it's infinite. It's the number of joint combination and movements a player could do in a basketball game. Yep. And it's, it, it's endless. Yep. It, it's yep. impossible to put a number on. And this is the problem with when I was growing up, dynamic stretches were seen as the new modern thing. And it would be like, oh, if a coach was doing static stretching, they'd be all oh, got to do dynamic. Now the reality is I view dynamic stretching as being inadequate because it's not opening up degrees of freedom. You're repeating the exact same movement techniques in the same planes of movement. That's not preparing you for basketball. If anything, you're putting pressure on the same joints every time, which is an injury risk, right? That's one of the biggest reasons I love differential learning in CLA because they're you know, they're distributing that weight across the whole body and, and becoming fluid movers, fluid adaptable movers. Um, so for me in the warm up, well, I actually posted this the other yesterday on my Instagram uh, and on my Twitter. I had, I had one coach say it was a great warm up for a circus act, which, which uh, gave me a very, very good laugh, I must say. Um, so, you know, for my warm up now, it's, I, I, I view it a few different ways. So I give the players ownership. So maybe I give them a prop and I say, make up your own movement task with repetition at repetition. They all know Nikolai, they're 16 years old and they all know Nikolai Bernstein. Um, so maybe I give them a PVC pipe, um, a tennis ball and in their pairs and they're all doing a different task, right? Um, then I'd say, all right, do lunges, explore different ways to lunge. Then, all right, get you're on this sideline, get to the other sideline, don't repeat the same movement once. It was utterly fantastic. Shavinio, one of my players, friggin' did a handstand, walked five steps with a handstand, then he moved down and, and rolled and tumbled over. I was like, whoa. And then on the way back, he was doing karate kicks. It was incredible. And then maybe we do some parkour. So I'd be like, all right, experiment with the wall. You got one minute, do as many different movements with the wall as you can. Then we did some differential learning with passing. And this was very funny. I think this is when one of the fundamentalist basketball Twitter coaches lost his rag a bit because I, I had some of my players lying on the floor and one of them, Oremus, was dribbling and he did this whoop, through his legs. Um, but it's amazing because if you think about it, degrees of freedom, they are working all the potential joint combinations and things and, and just becoming more adaptable. Um, so that would be an example of one of my warm-ups and it becomes more basketball specific as we go. So then for instance, you know, maybe we play some dribble tag towards the end or something like pass, keep away, even some one-on-one -on -one, to me, I'd put that in a warm-up, but maybe I'd constrain the O to finish off two feet or, or the defense can't jump, stuff, stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I, I just think with the warm-up too, it's key to get some perception action coupling in there. So you know, you, you're not just warming up the body, you know, if you want to want the body sit in the sauna, right. That's that would like warm up the brain too. So, you know, get them used to some of the things they're going to do in the practice um, and make it a little bit more task representative. Yeah. Definitely something like that jogs my mind. A few thoughts definitely go through. Talk about like, what about if we were to put perturbation on them? Like to say, we push them lightly as they're shooting like and they, right, may not, they may not initially like in the beginning I, I still like a little bit of progression so i might be standing to the side of them and i'm like i'm going to push you this way so that they can expect that but then after time goes by and we built somewhat of a a, a report they don't know where i'm going to be standing and they don't know which sure. way i'm going to be pushing it's not no, like i love that in, right i'd like, get into it straight away and just push them in different directions okay. and i do that and um and also we do stuff like jump and i'll give you a little push in the air 
this is a warm up in itself without the shot, but you can do it with shooting. A lot of these movement prep things you can do with shooting, just do it into shooting. So for instance, they're in the air. I'll say you got to catch yourself as high as you can, as low as you can, land on one leg or whatever. So they jump, give them a little nudge in a different direction. They land and then they shoot. Right. Yeah. Or maybe they land, they've got to do one dribble to explode, get as much separation as they can, shot. Right? There's so much you can do. It's great. Right. And this is the thing, it's like, for me, how boring is a traditional dynamic warm-up? And it's typically especially when I was playing, I remember it was the exact same thing all year in the practice and for the games. So it's like, what a waste of what a wasted opportunity to become a better mover. Even if it's 10 minutes, every practice, imagine if you can do different things over the course of a year, that's a lot of hours, a lot. To become a better mover. Yeah. And just like, just like, what you're saying is like primal movements, like rolling, like crawling, like mm -hmm. handstanding, like yeah, uh, yeah, squatting, exactly. like all this di different, like squatting in different directions, squatting in yeah. different angles. Different all speeds, that. velocity, like velocity, tempo, um, repetition at repetition. Yeah. It's I interesting, Will, because I know you're, uh, you obviously do a lot of in the gym in strength and conditioning. I'm working on applying, um, like dynamic systems theory, ecological dynamics, whatever CLA to the to the weight room too. So this morning I was doing like a bench press and I was just doing it slightly different every time. So you mean example? Slow, yeah. Yeah. Slow, okay. low, different holds. Now, if it's a low weight, I'll change grip as I'm doing it because it's safe. If it's like a heavy weight, I'm just going to keep the grip for safety, but still do it slightly differently every time. It's amazing. So we, we do that a lot, just not with the bench, because I mean, I, I feel like like this to what ratio could be like not great, but we do, we have vipers where we have different grips of, we, we do cool. push-ups with different different uh, positions and stuff like that. So definitely um, talk about, so when you talk about degrees of freedom, you talk about all that kind of stuff. Talk about what is an attractor and what is a fluctuator? And okay. Does it apply to shooting? Okay, so an attractor would basically be, I'll give you an example. Traditional practice, a shooter shoots a bunch of one, does a bunch of one on zero shooting. Okay, and actually studies have been proven on this, that the shoulder flexion, basically the positive angle of the shoulder is completely different when there's a defender and when there isn't a defender. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Um, so for instance, what a player doing a one on zero might develop a negative shoulder angle and a slower technique, a slower release. Why? Because there's no defense closing them out. I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll, another example. You see it a lot. Watch the footwork of players when you do shooting one on zero. Yeah. And what they're going to typically do is move their feet and take a second to adjust before they shoot it. You see it all the time. Right. Right. And what they're developing is when you do these massed reps over and over again, and then as soon as you put them in a game, five on five, they've basically developed techniques which are not optimal for that environment. And they've become basically stable, you know, techniques and attractors. So they've become something stable, a stable coordination pattern. And now the problem is it's not helping them for that level of the game. And especially when players go up the levels, the problem is, you know, these attract the prop these attractors. Um, if it's a negative attractor, it can obviously be even more apparent. So, for instance, say a player does a lot of one on zero shooting in high school, maybe it's not as much as a problem because they're not playing with as as you know that athletic opponents. They got more time on closeouts, more time to get their shot off, so it's okay. Then they go to the NCAA. Oh, big problem you know, the speed of the athletes, they're closing out on you. Now that attract is a problem. And then if, if they want to play professionally after, no chance, right? So that's basically, I hope I've given a good in-context definition of that. You did. Let me ask a follow-up question because I think that there's quite a few, like if I was listening to it and I had no idea what we're talking about, I might be a little confused. How do you combine physics with shooting, do you take into account physics when it comes to shooting? Even though everybody shoots differently, everybody has a different form, 
uh, has different form with different contexts depending on who's guarding them, uh, where they are on the court. You, you know what I'm uh, talking about. Like Newton's Newton's third law. I mean, and, I mean, um, yeah, yeah. Go, you go, you go. No, so I mean, would you take like, say, for example, ground reaction, gravity, mass and momentum, inertia into having a perfect shot? I'm not at the excuse me, not having a perfect shot, but in no, order think, to yeah. make it as easy as possible to shoot the ball. I think using the, the ground as force is essential. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. Just, just there haven't been any studies done on this, and I'd love to do one in the future if I found you know, someone in the research world that could help me with it. But just for my, for me seeing like the best shooters on my team, like Linus is the best shooter, right? And uh, I think a lot of people know him from my social media. And when you look at how he reacts with his environment, with the environment in terms of the floor, when he's shooting, he has such power generation. So it's like a very violent fight. Stop. Like, Stop. yeah. Stop. Yeah, and and I I feel like especially obviously we we change ranges when we shoot the whole time. We're always changing ranges, location, and especially when he gets out. Like we're shooting NBA threes and Dame Little threes, we call it a lot. And that's when you see it's just common sense. Obviously, the further you go from the basket, the more ground force you need. And it's but even you know when we're shooting like FIBA threes and stuff, the power that Linus gets from that is incredible now obviously like individual constraints i think a key here especially leg strength and that's why a good strength and conditioning program is essential um but yes i do believe that just to get that power generation that arc a good um a good ground force reaction is needed yeah so i'm just curious because like when i'm imagining you talking about that what i where i see you is somewhere underneath the basket or ahead of him, right? So as he's catching the ball, he's kind of recruiting that ground reaction force, fighting for his feet, and then going back, being able to recruit that scientifically, that makes total sense. But what yeah. if he's coming off like a downstream and it's like a zero one two? It's a little same or, thing. Same thing. So, but what yeah, I'm saying is if it's a one two, it's much harder to recruit the ground reaction force. Or is it like a zero one stop? Like with Yeah, so exactly and it's like obviously you can't go down straight away but I, I still feel you can get something you know maybe it's more lateral your power versus going just straight down and up but that is a big reason we also do the zero one two um because it's i think it gives more stability more power more separation than just the one two for sure do you yeah. what about the dip do you feel like yeah. it's not necessary or do you because i've had this discussion with coaches like what well, is your... let's, get, let's get the science on it world give me 10 seconds and i have to study up right here because i read it a month so i'll ago. go ahead and talk about it you go but, it and because i so, unfortunately when, when i read the studies i try and memorize them but this one i only looked at once so i can't right, i haven't so got it off my just, head. just from a physics standpoint um i'm a i'm a fellow of the i'm a, of applied functional science and with a great institute and we call this transformational zones. So basically, okay. if you just look at a jump, no one just jumps directly up, right? It's impossible. You have to go the opposite direction before you can produce force in the uh, in the, the direction that you want to. Just look at someone jump, or Alex, you line your guys up on the baseline and tell them whoever sprint to half court, whoever whoever gets the half court first cool. wins and wins whatever, right? They'll all instinctively put one foot behind the other and then sprint. And so. My question is, is that a lot of coaches talking about not dipping, but I can promise you if we just told the player not to think, just catch and shoot, catch and shoot, or whatever, they're going to dip the ball. Of is course. that an, is that an attractor? Would you consider that? An yeah, attractor? this is an interesting because it exactly could it be an act an attractor and something just like that they're naturally attracted to with their internal dynamics. I would say this. I think um, it depends because let's look at a few factors like player height, right? To get we the elemental variables from all the research I've done to get a, um, to give the ball the best chance of going in from a shot is having a high release, uh, a high release height, okay? And combining a high release height with the lowest possible release velocity. And the reason behind that is because the quicker you release the ball, 
the more the higher the margin for error. Okay, so you basically want the highest release angle with the lowest velocity possible. Okay, so then score Brad aiming to get the optimal arc, 45 degree entry to the rim. Um, but a seven foot player versus a Steph Curry is very different. So a player like Steph Curry, you know, to make up for, for that height difference, he's going to need that dip to get the, the power up there for the shot. Whereas maybe a seven footer, so they take someone like Dirk Nowitzki, they could just put the ball right here and shoot it. Yeah. So again, it's like, I think we have to think CLA, individual constraints, et cetera. But here's something. So here's the results of the study I found. So it was done um, by Luke Penner, uh, University of Manitoba. And um, they found basically that the dip, players who, they did dip versus no dip. And the players that dipped had a 7 to 9% increase in accuracy of their jump shots. And this was of university players. Now, again, we got to look at the study. I think it was done in a closed environment, mm -hmm. i.e., one on zero, right. you know, constant like spot shooting, et cetera. So we got to think, you know, how much weight is there to it? But still, it's very interesting. And it's like, with me, I think if you look at what most players would naturally do, they would dip, right? And it's like, again, traditional approach, coaches are like, to dip, to dip or not to dip. Well, it's like, you know, to get that, to get that power, I think it's, for a lot of players, it's going to be essential. Now, here's the thing. How would I, if it's maybe, let's talk about a player who's maybe developed an attractor of not dipping or whatever, okay? And maybe dipping could be more optimal for them. I don't know. I don't know the individual constraints. With, my, with the differential learning, we could do something with dips. So we could, for instance, do a no dip situation. And maybe that's a situation where it's a catch and shoot with 0 0.4 seconds on the clock. So you just can't dip. So you got to get it and go straight up, right? Then it's going to be a medium dip and then a really, really long exaggerated dip. Mm. So the idea is that maybe we nudge them towards exploring new things. Maybe they, you know, they develop new coordination patterns to incorporate a dip with their shot. Or maybe it doesn't work. I don't know. But I, I do think that... Um, if, if I had a player who was really struggling to get power, I would suggest using a dip to them. Um, but I'd do it in that differential learning approach where they experiment with different types of dip with do variability. You, do you think that you need to teach the dip? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, right. No, I, I just think it emerges naturally. I think the biggest problem would be if a player has a traditional coach who coaches them out of it. Right. Agreed. Totally agree. And so you're talking about your, uh, what is, is his name? Linus? Is it, Linus. Is that, yes. Linus, sorry. So for Linus, one of the things that, because I know what you're talking, I was watching him shoot. And for me, really good players, uh, really good shooters. And I want to put him in the same category of style of shooting as say Steph or Trey Young. Yeah, um, I think so. Cause he's so fluid and it, yeah. You totally. know what? It's more of like what I say. It's like a one motion shot. I don't really like to categorize it, but it's very fluid. And to be honest with you, if, if you look at it, his release is actually quite low. Like it's quite low. He starts from here and shoots the ball, but it's, I mean, it goes like, if you look at all the best players, especially the players that can shoot off the dribble, right? they have that in common with each other. Like they, they do have that in common. Why, where was I going with this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that like, one of the things is to be able to, oh, we are talking about the, the dip. One of the ways that I work on not dipping is I purposely pass the ball underneath their knees or maybe a little bit lower. And for that type of player like Linus, he would go directly up from there and shoot the ball. And therefore, he wouldn't really need. Sure. I wouldn't have to really say anything. Does that does that make sense? Because like yeah. he would just go right up. Oh, cool. and, and again, well, it's like being adaptable. You know, it's like maybe if if there's a player who's playing super close defense on you, maybe you you just can't dip. Right. Right. Impossible. So this again is the idea with developing adaptable shooters who can shoot in any situation and embrace movement variability. Can you shoot with both? So it's not a question of to dip or not to dip. It's like use both right and right. Is the situation and the interaction of individual task environmental constraints will determine you know whether you can 
dip on, not dip. Right. And, and obviously, you know, a catch and shoot open, you're going to have more time to do it. More, You'll have the affordance to dip. Whereas off the dribble, late clock, super tight defender, maybe you won't. You're going to get the ball straight off the dribble into, the re- into your release point. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. Well, we can definitely go on for hours about this, but I, I want to go into a different topic with you because we've had quite an interesting month in terms of social media. And I want to, I want to talk about this. I have to dive into it. So here we go. I want you to define to me, Alex, what would you categorize as fundamentals? And is your definition of fundamentals different from the, I don't want to say, but different from our, let's call it the average coach. Fundamentals gone onto my banned vocabulary list uh, <laughs> alongside, alongside the word talent, elite, and butts. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, what if, if you asked 100 coaches what fundamentals were, you'd get 100 different responses. Right. Um, and, and my biggest problem with it is it just, when you, when you hear the words, it's, you know, I re- immediately receive connotations of techniques, which are techniques which aren't even seen frequently in games, such as a two-hand chest pass in a straight line, right. a step slide on a zigzag drill, shooting with one hand, perfect form shooting. It's, just, it's literally most of, a lot of these fundamentals which coaches would talk about are things which you never actually even see, mm. never. But, but the thing is, well, it's like people, coaches, have, it's almost like there's almost like a radical cult of fundamentalists. Um, and it's, it's, you know, fundamentals are everything. Fundamentals are everything. And it's the opposite. Instead, you want, instead of having players be able to do one technique perfectly, you want them to do as many different techniques as they can. So, you know, my, Marco, Marco Sullivan talks about functional movement solutions. So I, I'm not using the word fundamentals. I'm talking about, you know, can the players have as many solutions as possible? Let's take passing. So for me, instead of a player being a fundamental passer who can make a chess pass, can they have like 50 different solutions with their passing? And again, it's like you're not teaching these. You're creating an environment which lets these things emerge, right? So can they pass in different, all different places, off the dribble, off the catch, with movement, without movement, to players in different locations, at, across different distances, with different speeds of the ball, uh, passing it to different locations of their teammate, right? That, to me, is, is what, I, what I'd strive to develop. So my rec- recommendation for any club coaches, schools, federations who are listening to this would be, refrain from using the word fundamental and instead talk about functional movement solutions. So initially what people saying is that you must develop adequate fundamentals before you can play basketball. Yeah. So, and that's the whole reason I wrote the blog because, because coaches believe that players have to have the fundamentals before, before they can play games or do more advanced things. And it's just, again, it's not true. Like, these coaches should just watch their players in the five on five, three on three or whatever, and see the number of things that they're doing without being taught. And this is because every player has a unique bibliography of completely different backgrounds before they've gone to that session. They've all had maybe different coaches in the past, different childhood experiences playing different sports, different social cultural constraints. Maybe one player had an older brother watched a bunch of the NBA, whereas another didn't. Right. So it's like every player is so different. And the problem is it's coaches. It's kind of like, like coaches are treating basketball like it's um, like Fordism, like Henry Ford in a factory. (laughs) Right. It's just the players going through a conveyor belt, give them all the exact same thing. You know, you're going to do this. You're going to do that. Boom, boom, boom. Then when you get to the end of the conveyor belt, you can go get to that next level. And it's Taylor, it's Taylorism. That was it. Cause I studied that at university. Taylorism was the, the, the name I was looking for. It's not how human development works and especially a complex sport like basketball. It's just impossible. It's really interesting. I had 
uh, experience like this myself. I was actually coaching a session and I always like to start the session by well, playing basketball, like just start by playing basketball. And it was like a three on three with kids. And it was, we had a whole lot of fun. It looked terrible because the kids were nine and 10 or whatever. Right. And a parent felt that it was uh, appropriate to I interrupt the session and say that it looks horrible. And I was like, okay, uh, what, do you, what do you think would be the best thing to do in this situation? And what their suggestion was is to line up and we're all gonna go and do free throws. And we're gonna go for the left hand, we're gonna go, okay, we're gonna go left, right, and then go up. And, and so it can look less chaotic. And so I, I, know what you, I know what you mean. And what's really interesting is for the kids that instantly had less fun, instantly had less fun. But at the same time, there was no opportunity to teach them any kind of decision-making or concepts. I, I would say for the most part, it's concepts of the game. And so I think I, I know what you're talking about. The biggest thing, Will, is like how many of these fundamentalist coaches are working with players that are going to be professionals? 0.1% right. yeah. probably. So why would you even think that they need these things? Why would you not be more focused with giving kids such an enjoyable experience so that they reap the true benefits of basketball? They can develop leadership skills, become more independent thinkers, all these things. Like, of course, that's what they develop when they're playing small-sided games versus these dumbass drills. And it's like coach, coaches just overestimate their role and the importance of their role and it's like it's not about teaching techniques teaching fundamentals instead it's like creating the environment where you just allow all these movement solutions to emerge and it's you know all these coaches will over the last month it's been crazy i've been getting like 10 messages a day which i've never had just on instagram twitter whatever with all these questions and things and coaches have been sending me clips of practices with fundamental coaches doing things like um, like the, oh, what do you even call it? The sliding defense drill where it's like one coach in the middle, all the kids in front. And you're like saying right, left. What do you call that drill? I don't even doing? know, but I, let's call it, I don't even know what it's called. But yeah. I know what you mean, yeah. Like, and doing like chest passes in lines, zigzags, string man weave. And it's literally like, <laughs> it's, not, it's not basketball. It's another sport. It's just, how can you think that those drills are reflective of basketball? And, and to go with the steps line, I, I, I was laughing because I could picture exactly what you're talking about. Teaching mechanics that are so yeah. off in terms of like a step and then a slide, right? And then not oh, only the best, do you do that, they get- Well, the best comment form. I had, the <laughs> best comment I had was hilarious. It was, uh, I posted the zigzag drill on Facebook and I think I, I, I said something like the most useless drill in, all, in the history of basketball. And one coach, one coach said, <laughs> maybe the reason your players can play good defense now is because their coaches when they were younger did this drill with them. Oh my God. <laughs> it was a really good one. <laughs> so, okay. So let me ask you this because I, I you, we're in different parts of the world. I would say that from what I've seen in Asia, you know, I've not seen everything that the way that we think may be there. If we're lucky, there might be like 5% of the people think the same way from, yeah. and I don't want you to say in Europe or whatever, but from everywhere in the world that you've been, how many, like is CLA differential learning being more adopted or okay. what, what do you think? So I've been lucky. I've been to 40 countries now through basketball, okay. which is a lot. Yeah. And for me, it's like, I've really disliked these basketball stereotypes where people are like talking about one specific country and it's basketball culture. If anything, I've found that, you know, the coach, like when people talk about this, those countries are actually the worst when it comes to pedagogy and coaching methodologies, et cetera. Um, for me, there are just, it all depends on individuals. And it's like now with all the reasons, like I'm from, I'm from the United Kingdom, right? And people mm. laugh at the UK, but geez, I know a lot of UK coaches who are super invested in their learning and doing a lot of great things, right? And all right, we're not Serbia and we don't have that basketball tradition, but 
does that mean that the things we're doing aren't as effective? Of course not. And for me, it's just pockets of excellence. You know, there could be one person in, I don't know, Burkina Faso and one person in Australia, one person in Kazakhstan. And if they've put in the time to research and they're really well informed and they're doing great stuff in their local community, well, that's a pocket of excellence, right? And it's, for me, I just think we have to be careful with generalizing sweeping remarks saying, oh, Barcelona, in this place is great because it's, you know, it's, it's just, it, it's, it's not the case. And if anything, well, I obviously here in Europe, I think we're 15 years behind and then oh. people, people talk about, Oh, European basketball. So good. And yeah, of course it's got a lot of positives, you know, cat coaches at the professional levels typically are very astute tactically, but Oh my God, in other areas, we are well behind. And, um, and you know, all the things I'm speaking about, I can, I can say this because I know for sure that I don't think I don't think there's another academy which embraces CLA and everything they're doing. There, there could be two coaches at that academy doing amazing things with their right. teams in CLA and stuff. But in terms of the whole program doing it, not the case. And that's what I'm trying to do with my prep academy, like literally embrace all these ideas into everything we're doing. And show, I, the reason I'm doing it is to show the basketball world that, you know, whether, wherever you are in the world, if you put in the work with the research and, and spend time to do that, you can do, you can do this anywhere. Definitely. Definitely. So what would your, what would your message be? Just the final thing. What would your message be to people who believe that fundamentals should come before playing the actual game? Check out some of the my blog first. So read my blog and detach opinions and personal sentiments from the things I write and the evidence which exists. Uh, and this is the thing. A lot of the kind of responses from coaches who don't like it, it's opinions. It's not based on any evidence base. Mm. So it's like I'm, I'm giving them all the evidence and things like that and the coaches don't like it and then they reply and they feel attacked and I'm not attacking anyone. I'm just attacking. I'm not attacking them personally. I'm just attacking the methodology. Right. So and I, I think to be honest, Will, put, if I put myself in their situation, I would understand why, because it's like, you know, if, if you've been doing something for 20 years right, and then, and then, you know, the validity of that approach is questioned. Oh, that's a difficult situation to be in. I fully understand, right? But it's like, you know, instead of attacking it, can you just try and consider the research? And you know what? Just try it and try a few practices where you do small sided games, things like that, and see the difference and the impact it has. And especially for people who may have had some success, right? And and it's they have to reflect on like are they happy with just doing what they're doing or is there another way out there? And so yeah. I've, I've interviewed some, or I've interviewed for the podcast, some pretty successful coaches at the high school and the college level. And the best one and the ones who stay around for the longest will always, no matter how old they are, they could be in their fifties and they're still questioning what they're doing. Um, and, and they're, they're not married to a certain approach. If they found a better approach for like within an instant, they would change everything. Oh, uh, well, that's the biggest thing. Like when I, when I moved to Belgium, that's what I thought I was getting into, right? Like a real growth mindset culture. And instead it was like the opposite. It was like, didn't like to have challenge coaches were like, Oh, I've done, I've done the research. Now I can just, you know, I've done the work now I can just keep doing the same old things and that's it. And it's not the case, right? It's every, every practice, Every, every week I'm learning something new. Now, of course, you don't, coaches don't have to go to those extremes. I'm trying to invest a lot of time in my development right now. But it's like, even if you just do one thing a week, one podcast, read 20 pages of a book, you're making steps. It's like atomic habits, you know? Um, and yeah, for me, it's like, I, I'd like to be even if I get, hopefully I get to my 70s, my 80s, my 90s, you know, even in my old age, I'd like to 
continue learning. And it's like, you know, I, to me, like the biggest trait in coaches that I like to work with is being a lifelong learner. It's like, all right, yeah, I, I want, it's, I like to have like people with a sense of humor who are fun, good people, but being a lifelong learner is critical, critical. Love that. Alex, thanks so much. I, I enjoyed just having chats with you. We'll definitely have more. Um, and just to be able to talk shop again, I had nothing really planned, but as we're talking, I was just scribbling some stuff down. So I thought it ended up being very good. And I, I hope a lot of people listen and, and learn from this conversation. Great. Well, that was really fun. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, man.